Expanding World in association with the Explorers Club are proud sponsors of this episode of Life's Tough, Explorers Are Tougher, and the Global Exploration Summit, a pioneering endeavor bringing together the world's leading explorers, sharing cutting-edge technology and innovations to propel us toward the next frontier in the future of exploration and to make a difference in the future of humanity. Visit GlexSummit.com to learn more about the Global Exploration Summit and the impactful men and women who are the heart and soul of scientific innovation and exploration. One of the things I find most interesting when two explorers get together is we sort of trade stories. This is Life's Tough, but explorers are tougher. I'm your host, Richard Weiss. I love the outdoors. I always have, and I always will. I've heard stories that would make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Explorers are the type of people who walk in space, go to the bottom of the ocean, and stand on the highest summits. Scratch the surface of any explorer, and you'll find they're all storytellers. This show is about their tales. Our guest today, Bo Parfit, has summited the highest peak on all seven continents and is also a successful financial investor. Yet he almost didn't make it out of the second grade. Bo Parfit, welcome to Life's Tough. Explorers are tougher. Second grade seems a little early in the game to sort of be cashing in the chips. <laughs> Richard, thanks for having me. Um, second grade, the story is when I was in second grade, it was a parent teacher conference. And, you know, I kind of, I overheard my, my second grade teacher telling my parents, you know, Hey, listen, this, this guy's really struggling. <laughs> this kid's struggling. He's not going to make it out. Of, he'll never graduate high school. And I'd love to tell you that I, I heard that and that I went home that night and I said, Hey, I'm going to prove him wrong. And Hey, there's a great story. The truth is I went home that night, thought there was something really wrong with me, cried my eyes out. And, you know, I just, it was a really long process, Richard. I worked, I started working hard. I got a tutor. I also had a speech impediment. So on top of being dyslexic and struggling to, you know, read and write, I also had a speech impediment. So I kind of had the double dose. Um, my parents quite, quite, quite weren't sure what to do. So I had a tutor and I started tutoring and I just, I just slowly started working harder. And then in seventh grade, my seventh grade tutor told my parents, I've got some good news. Bo will graduate high school, but not college. <laughs> <laughs> Bo, I, I don't know why people are dismissing you. Now, I know you for quite a few years. And one of the things that you are as a, is a very agile speaker. I've heard you up on stage. I've heard you. So how could these teachers have been either so irresponsible or guessed so wrong? You know, I think that for, for a lot of folks who's ever listening, whoever has a disability out there, right, a learning disability, maybe it's a physical handicap, maybe it's a more on the kind of a, a dyslexia type of uh, situation. But the, 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 the fact the school only teaches that, you know, there's about 35 different ways people absorb information, and maybe it's 40, right, but there's a lot of ways that people absorb information. And it's just finding the way that you absorb information. Unfortunately, school only teaches about one or two of those. So if you don't fit into that mold, um, you can really struggle. But once you figure out your method of learning, then you can really take off. And it, and I, I discovered how I learned the best really in college, but I had to I had to suffer through a lot of years to figure out my best, best learning style. I mean, you've graduated from Kellogg Business School, which is one of the top business schools in the country. And you're a financial investor. And, and I've seen you at seminars. What do you think was that moment? Was it a long process or... When did you actually feel that you could be good at something? I, I started, I, I really, a couple of things, you know, it's, you got to pick something that you're good at. So if there's any parents out there, for me, I fell in love with basketball. So basketball was an area that I could excel because I put a lot of time and effort into it. So basketball started to build my confidence and I, I kind of liked math. You know, I like to practice math. I wanted to get fast at math. So then math was another building block. So I kind of turned these stumbling stones um, or these stumbling blocks into stepping stones, if you will. 
Um, but I really started to hit my stride in high in college. And one of the tricks that I learned is if I could get notes, if I could get notes from a, just pick a class, I walk in there, I find three people that I think are smart and they're gonna take copious notes and good notes, like the cool kid in back that's trying to pretend he's not smart, but he really is smart. You know, the real, the, the person in front that wants in the front row that's asking all the questions. So I'd get three people to give me their copies of their notes. I'd compare all three notes. If I found something on all three notebooks, Richard, it got a green, green highlighter. If two of the three notebooks had it, it was a yellow. And then if it were on the notes and in the textbook, there was like a 90% chance it would be on the exam. So I, I got to, that was kind of a, a trick that I came up with and it really helped me absorb information really quickly. But Bo, I can tell you where that, that trick didn't work out so well. So you and I met around 2002 or uh, 2003 and you asked me if I would be in a three-day canoe race in, in the jungles of Belize. And uh, you assume since I was the president of the Explorers Club, I must know what I'm doing. And to this day, I tell people the closest I've ever come to dying is in a canoe race with you. Do you remember? You, I'm sure. Well, of course you remember that. I do. And, and Richard, you and I both know this, and a lot of the listeners do as well, is when they read the story about the great expedition or it's in the National Geographic or a documentary, you, you only hear about these successful expeditions. But as you and I, you and I know, and many others know, most of them, most of them fail. You know, most of them are, are you know, a lot of lessons learned there. So we, um, we did this amazing uh, canoe race in Belize. Um, so the fun tagline, remember, can you Belize it? Remember, because it was a canoe race. <laughs> <laughs> I do. But Richard, well, what I'll never forget when we were almost, when we almost should have probably perished, it was you and I and, and, John, and Liebs, right? Remember Jonathan Liebo? We got, we all had our life jackets on. We got sucked under this, you know, in rapids, Trainer. far right side. And we were all pinned under the water for a long time. I came out first, Liebs was second. And what felt like five, six, seven minutes, I was like, where's Richard? You know, I was panicking and bang, you popped out. Thank goodness. But none of us, what was so amazing about that is none of us had our life jackets on after. I don't know where they went. They kind of just, met, you know, Someone, someone was looking uh, over us that day. You know, I, I learned a few things from that, and I have replayed that scenario in my head a few times. I learned that you could never underestimate the apprenticeship of skills, that you need skills when you do things. Uh, I did learn that some of the training that my father had given me, he was a pilot, about creating this bubble of calm when you're in an emergency. And I learned something about you. You popped up, you know, you sort of shook it off really quick and we were back in the race. And, and I thought, wow, this guy really just went through something that something would that have most people say, uh, you know, I'm out of here. And, and you were just like, we were in dead last place at, at that point in the race. And every hour we try to see if we could pass someone else and get further up and further up. And, and that was, that was a great introduction. That was fun. And it, it was, it's a testament to your character as well. I think, we knew we were in dead last by hours. I mean, we were in dead last by hours. And we just said at some point, it was pretty quickly on, we said, how, do, how can we make this more fun? Let's not finish last. Remember that? So let's, and then when we first saw that first boat, boy, we, <laughs> all this adrenaline kicked in and we just started rowing, you know, as fast as we could. And we, all of a sudden we weren't, we were in second to last place. And that kind of buoyed our spirits and said, hey, let's go pass another boat and another boat and another boat. Well, I don't know if you remember the boat we uh, passed first. It was a grandmother with her dog in the back of the canoe. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, to think, yeah, I mean, there were some really good canoers in there. But, you know, I think I, I'd like to think that really started your uh, sort of career as an adventurer explorer. It, it did. Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of. There's a, there's, I, I just read Ryan Holiday's new book called The Obstacle is the Way, a great book. And I just couldn't help but thinking, you know, what, right? We had The Obstacle is the Way. You know, if you get, if you're faced with something difficult, um, there's, there's great learning there. And if you push through it, you know, you're usually come out of the other side a better person. Bo, oh, but, you know, on your, and for those of you who don't know what the seven summits, it's the idea is to climb the highest peak on all seven continents. And I believe, um, 
without exception, there was always some major obstacle on every one of your climbs. And unfortunately, uh, and I've never had this happen, you've actually had people die on, you know, on your expeditions. I, I believe on Everest might have been the first place. The the first time that I saw um, folks die was on Mount McKinley, or Denali, I guess now. Um, and we we had we were going up to the fourteen thousand foot camp right before the famous headwall, and we kind of were headed by us. They were heading down, and maybe forty five minutes later, you could hear this big pop, and you could hear the kind of the avalanche and the rock fall. And the group that had just that just passed us, um, one of the folks there uh, got hit hit by a rock. Actually, quite a few of them did, um, and that was uh, that was that was not a good situation. Um, and then, you know, I've, I've never been in the military. It's one of my biggest regrets is that I didn't serve in the military. So I wasn't prepared for all the, the kind of the, the death that you see on these big peaks. But yes, seeing a lot of uh, a lot of people you saw that day and the next day, hey, that person died in the ice fall or that person died high up on the mountain. Um, and then, they, you know, if they're low enough down, you see the bodies coming down right past you. Um, you see people that sometimes the body sits there because they it takes a while to get a group to carry them down. So you're walking by a dead body um, up high on the mountain. You see the skeletons, um, you know, just kind of right off side of the, of the route. Um, and that's, you know, coming up on those in the dark with your head torch is, is definitely a, a strange feeling. And, you know, you want to make, it makes you focus and it makes you uh, definitely humble. Uh, you and I happened to run into each other at base camp on Everest in, I believe it was 2005 or, or, or six. And uh, it was interesting because you would come down from some of the, the higher camps and then you were going to go back up. But I often have people come to me and go, my dream is to climb Everest. And, you know, you say, oh, what kind of experience? And they go, no, I've never worn crampons, but I'm really tough. How tough is it? I remember you saying to me that you had a tent mate, I think it was a tent mate, that at about 27,000 feet, you got to your tent and he sat there and cried because he couldn't remember how to take his boots off. And, and, and it's just sort of a testament to what altitude does to people. Yeah, there, there are so many stories um, about, you know, either pulmonary edema, edema or cerebral edema, hypoxia, the altitude affecting people. Uh, you know, one story I think I'll probably never forget is I was climbing, this was on Choyo Yu. So for those of you that don't know, you, Choyo Yu is the sixth tallest mountain in the world. It's in Tibet. And I was skiing it. So I had the skis on my back. I'm going up for the summit and it's dark, right? You leave at midnight. So you got this little head torch on and way, and way up ahead, um, you know, I saw this fixed he headlamp and I was like, oh, I really, I'm really gaining on this person. And um, I don't know, 30 minutes later, I caught up and I was like, wow, I'm really gaining on this person. Well, it turns out as I got up there, this person had the, their oxygen mask was off. They were holding their Nalgene water bottle, okay, with their glove off, oh. completely passed out and just kind of slumped over. And I went, hey, hey, buddy, hey, buddy, hey, are you there? Hey no movement. Okay. Kind of gave him a little shook, no movement. I took my glove off and I shoved it down his back. He was still warm. And, and I just said, he would not, he would not wake up. And so I put his oxygen mask back on him, cranked it up to four, you know, the highest level radio down and said, you know, Hey, I've got a situation here. There's someone, this is generally what he looks like. You know, uh, you know, we, we need, this is, he needs some help. You know, I, he's unconscious. And, you know, so I started relaying back with, you know, finding out who he was, the right base camps. And then about three minutes later, his eyes open up because he had been, you know, he's breathing oxygen now. And he can, then he kind of looked over at me and he goes, how are you? Oh I go, <laughs> how am I? How are you? <laughs> if I would have walked, you know, climbed by you, you'd be, you'd be toast, you know? And he goes, yeah, I'm just kind of resting and I'm going to head up. I go, you're not heading up, you're heading down, you know? So then I had to <laughs> explain to him kind of what happened, the situation. And, and I sat there with him uh, for quite a while. And then 
you know, a, a Sherpa came up uh, actually pretty quickly and found him and, and uh, he, he ended up getting down the mountain. But, um, you know, there, there's a lot of situations like that. You put people in gamma bags, you know, gamma bags to help kind of decrease, decrease the air temperature. Um, you know, putting adrenaline shots into people or dexamethasone, the shot into people's thighs, trying to, to help people, um, you know, not succumb to the altitude. So how tough is it on Everest? I mean, for people who haven't been there, they hear the stories, but you've been there, you know, a couple of times, I think. It's, what's it like in what they call the death zone? The the death the death zone is the death zone is a very difficult um, experience and environment. Um, a lot of people talk about that your cognitive level is about that of a third or fourth grader because the you know there's just the oxygen um, is it's such a low oxygen per breath. Um, I can't remember the stats anymore, but is it what is it seventy or eighty percent less oxygen than at sea level? So. It, it is what a lot of people don't know. So in t- it took me in, you know, shameless plug here in my book, Die Trying. Okay, one man's quest to climb the seven summits. If you're really bored, you can check it out. Um, but let me know if you if you read it, because I can tell my wife, at least somebody read it. <laughs> okay. I, I've read um, it. Yeah, I know. You wrote the forward, which was great. Thank you. So in that book, I sl- climbed Everest in 2005 uh, and did not make it. Okay, I I made it in 2007, but in 2005, our team was going for the summit attempt. Uh, It was it was bad weather. It was like June 4th or June 5th. It was one of the latest summit attempts um, in the history of Everest. And what happens when you acclimatize, people go, I need to acclimatize. It means you're putting more red blood cells. You're getting more red blood cells into your blood. So think in your veins and arteries, think of wet cement going through a pipe. So that big, wet, heavy cement, if there's any type of clog in there or your artery isn't 100% clear, a lot of people die of heart attacks or strokes. So we are going for our summit attempt and our, and our dear friend and team member, Rob Milne died. And when that ha- and he and I had, I had passed by Rob about, I don't know, an hour before, and I, I kind of had my ice axe and I kind of smacked him kind of on the, on the butt and said, hey man, we're climbing Everest, we're doing it. And he kind of smiled back and, you know, kind of, we kind of gave a little high five and, you know, an hour later, this chatter on the inner, on the, on the radio, which went bananas and he, he had died and he had died instantly, um, which is obviously it's very sad, but we, it, it wasn't something where we had to do a big rescue. Um, he died instantaneously. At that point, the Sherpas get very weary because they believe that you disturbed, you know, the mother, the, you know, the goddess or the spirit in the mountain. And the spirit it didn't go back in the mountain. It's still out around in the mountain and could kill someone else. <clears throat> so they wanted to re- they wanted to head down and um, there a whole host of other uh, scenarios. So we decided to, as a group, we eventually all headed down. That was a very difficult day. Um, and you know, Rob Mild and his family. Um, I still you know I love them to death and I think about them often. But it was it's uh, it's the death zone is not a uh, forgiving place. It's very very scary and you have to stay focused. Bo, you're, you're, you were single when all of that happened, and now you're a married guy, you got a couple kids. Does that idea of taking that kind of risk, it's, you know, it's always a, a risk. Uh, has that changed the equation for you? It has. You know, a lot of people have said to me, hey, what's the tough, toughest mountain you've ever climbed, right? And I, I could easily say, well, K2 in Pakistan, right, the Savage Mountain. Uh, which which I climbed about five years ago. I could say Everest, right? Because of, of of a lot of the situations and adversity we face there. But really, the toughest mountain I've had to climb um, is myself, is my own mountain. So as an explorer, you explore your outer world, but the really good explorers, I think, also explore their inner world and what can they learn about themselves, you know, in this journey we call life. So it's you know, when I left to climb K2, which is kind of, you know, my big dream, there's been more people in space than have summited K2, Uh, much higher death rate. Everest, I think, is one out of 10 that perish. K2 is about one out of four. Um, I had a three-week-old baby, and um, that, and that did, uh, it was tough, because I really wanted to go with a specific team, and I thought the timing was right. I just spent a year and a half training, 
And uh, I end up going to K2, very difficult on, on my family there. Um, my wife wasn't too pleased with me. Uh, when no, I, came I, re- I remember this, Bo, and I remember <laughs> my advice to you was, this isn't cool, Bo. I don't know if you recall that. So, you know, this was one of those things where you have to sort of switch from, because when you climb a mountain or, or do a, an activity like that, it's, it's very inwardly driven, right? It's about you. It's about how you get there. But at that point, you had a wife had just had a baby and you're off to Pakistan, which isn't exactly the safest country to go to. It's true. If I had to do it over again, I, I, sh- I, I wouldn't have gone. I could have waited a year or two. Um, I could have, I could have done it before I was married with kids. Um, yeah, definitely a lot of lessons learned there. A lot of humility for sure. And so, you know, now that once you finish those seven summits, I mean, was there a sense of relief, a sense that you wanted to do more, a sense that you were going to settle down? So how does this all culminate? It's a good question. You know, I think that it took me the seven summits for me because I was I was working or I was in graduate school and I I had to kind of either use vacation time at work or find a um, you know find a break in school and try to go knock one off. I think it took me seven or eight years. It was a seven eight year goal, and I remember finishing it. And um, I was very you know it's funny you're very you're happy you're proud that you're flooded with all these emotions. And you, you know, for me, I, and many other people, you look and naturally look to see what's next. Um, You know, for me in 2007, it was entrepreneurship and I wanted to kind of climb that mountain. So I started a a, a business that had apartments in college towns. So student housing apartments and that business became, um, you know, you know, decently large and and very successful. So Bo, if if you had to sort of look at the major, you, you, you've had some very pivotal moments in your life. You had this whole, you know, fighting against the inferiority complex that maybe teachers gave you in, in school. You had uh, to, to face so many people dying around you, mountains. You probably have had more people die around you than any other explorer I know. And then, you know, obviously you uh, get married, have kids and And, you know, you go through ups and downs on the finances, you know, is there a takeaway? Is there something in life that you, you sort of think when this is all and said and done would have been the the best move, worst move? Um, Say, say, reframe that question. Well, I'm just saying is you, you, you come away from all this, you know, you've had some major experiences that could have driven you one way or another. You know, the mountaineering could have gotten killed. School, you could have just given up because, you know, after hearing that you're not good enough, why wouldn't you start believing it? So is there any takeaway, anything that you're going to tell your two sons, you know, as they grow? I always, I, it's a good question, Richard. Um, I told my kids, I'd spoke to my kids today. So I'm at this, I'm at this conference in California and my kids are in Colorado and I spoke to them on their way to school. And I, and I try, I try to say this to them every morning. I just said, you know, I just, you, mess, you don't necessarily have to be the best student, right? But I said, I just want you to be the hardest working student today. Can you promise daddy that you'll, you'll be the hardest working student? So I, I really believe in hard work. Um, I believe in humility. And, you know, if you, if you never give up, I mean, that's a, that's a tough thing to say. It's kind of cliche. Oh, never give up, you know, keep going, but it is so true. And, you know, everyone in life receives setbacks, but, you know, there's always a teaching, there's always a silver lining in that. And, you know, I, I love the phrase I actually heard. um, So this was from Rob O'Neill, the famous Navy SEAL. He said, the wolf on top of the hill is not as strong as the wolf coming up the and and as we conclude, I'm going to sort of go with an inside joke that we've said to each other on many occasions. Hey, Bo, you can always be my wingman. <laughs> Bull crap, you can be mine. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, ju- just for the audience to know that uh, I probably have quoted more 
lines of Top Gun with Bo than any other human on earth. Hey, Bo, thanks for uh, sharing your time today on Life's Tough Explorers or or Tougher. It's uh, be very interesting to see uh, where the next uh, 40 or 50 years leads you. So, and, and, and hopefully we'll be in another canoe race together. Absolutely. Can I, can I end with one remark? Is that okay? Yes, you may. All right. So one, one kind of cool mountain that we're climbing as a family is we have a, um, we have a kind of an impact investing or a venture philanthropy entity. It's called Denali Venture Philanthropy. It's just for my family. It's very small, very humble, but we have a goal to bring 300,000 people from working poverty to middle class or higher. Okay. 300,000 people. Um, and we're over 50,000 people so far. So that's been a great mountain to climb. Our boys are involved with that. And that's something that uh, is a great mountain to climb. And, and probably when we hit 300,000, we're gonna, we'll climb another mountain. So you keep going. Um, and then one other thing you said, Richard, one of the things about having a, a disability of some sort is you fail so much when you have a disability. Hey, I'm learning to walk, or I'm learning how to talk, or I can't see, or I have a dyslexia. And when you have a, something like that at such a young age, you just fail all, all the time. And then pretty soon failure becomes, it's, you're, it's just not scary anymore. So I, I would also say to my kids and anyone listening is, don't be afraid to fail because you learn a lot. And I, I think I read this, that 40% of the CEOs out there are dyslexic or have some form of disability. So, you know, failure and, and uh, there's a lot of good lessons there, a lot of res- resiliency you can learn from failure. Thanks, Bo. And, and, and if someone Thanks, wanted Bo. to find out more, more about you, Bo, uh, where can they look? They could go to Bo, uh, B-O, Parfit, BoParfit.com or Denali Venture Philanthropy. Um, look, I'm happy to give, share my two cents with people. Um, I'm not promising that there's, you know, hopefully there's a couple uh, nuggets or words of wisdom, but um, I definitely uh, am still learning. And there's a lot I can probably learn from, from people that reach out to me too. So I look forward to that. Well, good, good way to look at life. Thanks again, Bo. Thanks for having me. Good to see you.